Here we are. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the. I hope you can hear us. Welcome to the November design stream. Holy crap! It's November. I know. <laughs> yeah, it, ha it happened yet again. <clears throat> I hope everyone is doing well. Uh, it is now cold in Minnesota. I have switched from my like. October Viking gear to the November Viking I'm gear. fighting it. I'm still wearing a t-shirt yeah. in the office, but I I have a sweater just in case. I like relish. I relish the return to sweaters. I just, I want to be wearing sweaters all year. I, my skin burns all the time, so I don't want to <laughs> wear anything. So, there you have it. There you I have don't want to wear anything. And today is uh, voting in most of the nation, but... Yeah, if you have local elections, especially. Yeah, yep, St. Paul, there's a uh, mayor election, and uh, which I assume is just going to be the incumbent by a landslide. I think so. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> although it's ranked choice, so who knows what will happen. Yeah, so who knows what will happen, and then we're voting on rent control, which will be the strictest rent control in the nation. In the, in the nation. Know, even stricter than the Minneapolis one, which I understand the Minneapolis <laughs> is just like, they're asking basically for permission to start doing it. Yeah. Whereas the St. Paul one actually has a proposal. And then school board, which I know nothing about. Oh, yeah. There, well, there's contentious issues because they're thinking about consolidating some of the elementary schools. Yes. Yep. So, and then, again, that'll also be ranked. So. Yeah, it's like a pick three, you pick three out, out, out of five. Six or five. Yeah, yeah, and then, and then, and then, and then there's ranked. one for the at-large. Yep. But, yeah, go vote. Um, the local elections, if you ever feel like you don't vote because you don't feel like your voice is getting heard... Vote in the local election. You might be one of a thousand people voting. <laughs> voting. <laughs> um, you'll let, probably never have your voice heard as loudly. Uh, yeah, so that's that's happening here, which also means it, I don't. Is it Minnesota wide that the kids are off school, or is that just a? Yeah, I yeah I don't know. My daughter's school is being used as a polling place, so she's at home today. Ah, that would explain to avoid to avoid uh, to avoid getting COVID. <clears throat> okay, well, thank you, uh, Barrett. I'm glad you're liking this. Let's bury it. Bury it, sorry. <laughs> All right, so let's get to it. We have kind of a lot to talk about. Um, first thing, Patrick, uh -huh. I hear you run a game studio. Do you like games? I do. <laughs> what have you been playing? You know, it's funny you mention that. I think. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm a little uh, a TV host here. We, we kind of had like a moment, I think you and I both, mm -hmm. uh, this month. Yes. Where we were like, you know, I kind of like playing games. It's weird. And, and maybe, I'm, maybe I'm putting words in your mouth. No, no, no it's true, though. There's... Yeah. Um, but just, like, we've just been so busy with doing our stuff, and uh, we're both parents of young children. Mm -hmm. And so, like, I, it was just a, like, I've just been, like, picking up board games and playing them whenever I want again, and it's weird. I'm there's starting like a, to there's, enjoy it again. There's a funny thing where, like, if you're, if you're working on something actively... Any time you're playing a game, but you're not playing the thing you're working on, you feel like you're stealing. Mm -hmm. You're like cheating mm -hmm. on the mm -hmm. thing that you should be working on. Um, and I don't know, something in the last six months, I feel like we've been playing a lot more. Well, your kid's probably getting easier to take care of. Yep, that's and, true. And the youngest. And then uh, and then I, I think it's like the, uh, uh, the shifting of responsibilities within the studio has helped you and I kind of do like pull yeah. some straws off of our... Well, um, I think even just, at least if, speaking for myself my various projects got into spots where I wasn't really worried about them. Mm -hmm. Like, I know how long it's going to take to do to, to, to walk the walk of finishing. Yeah, yep. And so I felt this, like, huge burden left. So we played... My brother was in town a couple weeks ago, and we played Taj Mahal, like, a ton. Yeah. We just played a bunch of Taj Mahal. So I don't play games as much as you, still. Ah, well, you play War Cry. I play, yeah. You play a lot of War... I think by <laughs> hours, you're uh, probably pretty close. Well, by painting hours. Yeah, so last weekend I got into War Cry, uh, which is uh, what I've been playing, um, and then uh, well, it was three Saturdays ago. Last two Saturdays, so last Saturday we did this marathon where we assembled every figure in Warhammer Quest. The new Warhammer mm -hmm. Quest. It took us ten people hours to do to get it all assembled, and then oh we played. Gosh. We played, and then we played last weekend, and uh, it's like my review of it is it's like. Um, it's like a Bruce Lee. I don't know if he actually said this, but like, be, be afraid of the man that does it thou the same kick a thousand times mm -hmm. instead of a thousand different kicks. Because this, there's only a few scenarios in the game, but they're good. Yeah. So they hmm. they're able to focus on making them good. Now we'll see if the repetition makes them boring. Yeah. So, but yeah. And then uh, I uh, I found a Stellaris mod I like. 
Combines a lot of my other Stellaris mod enjoyment, yeah, yeah, yeah. so I, I've, I've... Oh, that's great. I've gotten... I've been playing Stellaris, and I actually rolled... I was like, I'm going to play a diplomatic race, and I'm going to try it again mm -hmm. every time. Oh, there's a murderous genocidal robot next to me, and this time it was... No, everyone, there's, there's a puzzle. Yeah, I, I can actually, play the diplomacy. Yeah, like, oh. yeah, that's really cool. Yeah. That's like always the holy grail of those digital strategy games. It's like a meaningful diplomacy system. So I'm winning the game with the smallest army. Yeah, that's small fleet. I mean, the small fleet. I hope there's an achievement waiting for you. Ah, uh, now I'm playing with mods. So, okay, well, yeah. I mean, what have you been playing? A spiritual, a spiritual achievement. We've been playing Metro Dread, which uh, I have a very interesting relationship with because I have played a lot of the. Um, I think all but like the second Prime games. I played the first Metroid Prime, mm -hmm. but I've been playing Metro games for a long time. And we, like I used to have friends in high school, we'd speed run Super Metroid. I really like the genre. I recognize. I think people um, present a lot of like really good critiques of Metroid is like having some problems in terms of its design and what it asks of its players. But so I, I don't think it's like a perfect game. I don't think any of the Metroids are perfect, but I enjoy all of them. And I've been playing Metroid Dread with my kids. Uh, and it's been a very weird thing to play with them because they play a lot of Switch. On, so we do Switch on the weekends. They play video games on the weekends. Mm -hmm. And I'm not around. Usually I work on the weekends or I, I'll be you know catching up on house stuff. And what will happen is in the evening, on Monday or something, I'll have time to play Metroid Dread, and they, ha they have advanced the game like an hour. Mm -hmm. And I have no idea what I'm supposed to do. <laughs> and so it actually is, is giving me the feeling of playing an older Metroid game, because it's like every, every third hour, a stranger takes the controller for a while, and then I can kind of return to like, oh, I guess... Oh, I have a new power at this time, and they aren't they aren't quite strong enough players. Yet. They're pretty young, so like they won't beat any bosses. So oftentimes, when I load into Metroid, I am right in front of a boss. Yeah, and then I have to puzzle my way through the boss and do some stuff. But I think we're um, most of the way through the game now. I feel I feel like I have most of the powers, um, and it's been great. It's a good game. And then in terms of I board, feel like we should figure out how to capture the energy for a board game. So every three rounds, Someone the game plays a round for you, and then you just have to deal with the consequences. And then you just have to deal with I mean, it. It's yeah. a little bit like letting your friend borrow your copy of, of Oath, I suppose. Yeah. Um, but uh, other than that, I've been playing lots of the Arkham Horror card game. I played the Blob scenario uh, with, with some friends, and my wife and I finished Dunwich, or, or we haven't quite finished, but we're very close to finishing Dunwich. And then we might start Carcosa, or we might do a different campaign cycle. We've been really enjoying it. I think... Uh, I so appreciate the design of the Arkham Horror card game. I think I've talked about it a little bit with Patrick. I think what, what's so cool about it is most co-op games are like amusement park rides. And even when you get different customization options, like Spirit Island I think is a good example, where it's almost like you can, you know, it's like you're going on a amusement park ride and you can change how your car looks. You can change like where the hills are going to be in your car. Mm -hmm. And like maybe you make your car go faster or slower, but it's still kind of the same ride. Like, guess what? The colonizers are coming. And what's cool about Arkham Horror is that it's so modular. And my only problem with it is that I think it just costs too much money to get into, to like mm. get to the good part. Mm. It's, I mean, it's, it's, I guess it's like, it's like a traditional collectible card game in that way that like it gets really good once you've spent like $100. And I yeah. hate saying <laughs> I hate it. Sure. Um, sure. Surely there, there's another delivery method. Um, I don't. I just feel like they should put the series together into one box, which I guess I think that yeah, I think they're yeah, doing it. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see how it goes. Um, I, I I get. I appreciate what they were trying to do with the monthly release, but I, I think it's. I think we're past that point now. Uh, yeah. It's interesting. So uh, Kyle just discussed his strategy for beating Mega Man, which was his brother would play the level, and he'd mm -hmm. play the bosses. And and the last guy, the the the, the hand of the king or whatever it is mm -hmm. in Dead Cells, because mm -hmm. he summons ads, you have to fight the ads, and then you have to fight him, and then you have to fight the ads, and you have to fight him. Yeah. I actually, whenever I fight him, I just pause it and wait like thirty seconds and switch my thinking to how you fight that thing. Oh, interesting. So I don't have to keep switching back and forth. Otherwise, it just eats up my spoons like crazy. Hundred yeah. percent. That yeah. makes a lot of sense. Um, yeah, and I and I'll, I'll start doing the drop like jump thing I do to, to do damage on the guy on the main guy and I'm like that's not going to work against him we uh, we recently I think I mentioned this a few nice years ago with my kids we played through all the Mega Man games and usually they could do the levels and I do the bosses mm -hmm. and when I when we beat X3 the boss was so hard that like I my hand was like hurting and mm -hmm. I was like I don't know if I can still beat this boss yeah. it was like the first time I felt like I really confronted the fact that I'm not like a 14 year old yeah, <laughs> playing these games. Yeah. It was just, 
it was just very very tough and, and that the boss for X3 is irritating it's like an, it's like a bad almost like a bad Super Nintendo design sure. it's like very small hitbox like kind of bullet heli yeah it doesn't feel as fluid as some of the other bosses. So they're talking about Inscription a lot, which has just popped up on Steam. It's a, uh, I believe it's a roguelike deck. Yeah, Drew's been playing it. Drew yeah. loves Inscription. Yeah. It's a, it's like in my like buy soon pile. Yeah, so, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. It seems really good. So anyway, um, well. yeah. So we've been playing games. So now this segment, which used to be us thinking about the last game we played four weeks ago, is now. Yeah, it's now. Yeah, yeah. yeah I mean, we, I, we, I actually played Stellaris in our before I walked in here. So. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> Uh, okay, so studio update. Well, what have we been up to? Uh, so someone asked right at the top of the chat which was further along, Ahoy or Arcs, and I can tell you that Ahoy is much further along. It's almost done. We we played a game in studio yesterday that felt like amazing. It I'm felt, writing down the Kickstarter question. It felt we'll so clean and balanced, and there was really interesting interplay. And there were a couple parts that I just want, that need a little bit of tightening. Uh, but it's it's very close. We um, we waited longer to put Ahoy into public testing than we'd ever waited on any project that we've done. Mm. And that's because we wanted to focus the testing around usability and balance as opposed to around design. Um, but I expect it's going to be fully done within a month and a half, two months, which means many months of product design and printing and all the rest, and hopefully we'll have it ready for you all by the middle of next year or so. Um, but in terms of the actual like design of the game, it's it's cooking right along. Mm -hmm. um, and Arcs is the the core engine is getting very close to being done. So I can I can sit down and play. I've played now three games of Arcs where I didn't change any of the system rules, didn't adjust any of the systems. We just sat down and played the game. The content for that game, what I'm doing right now is figuring out, uh, we call this like templating, which is how like how do you talk about the powers on cards? What does a card need to hold in terms of the information it has? How should it be kind of laid out? So this is like partially a design question, partially a graphics question, partially an editorial question. And I'm trying to answer that and kind of come up with a style sheet for the generation of content because I have maybe 40% of the content drafted for the core box, uh, but a lot of it needs a many rounds of review, and then so overall I think the content's probably like sitting at 20% or so. But the actual design is getting really close to being done. Uh, but there's just a lot of work. And I don't get, because everyone, m much of the team right now is working on Ahoy, like, I don't get any more art from Kyle for like a month and a half. So once Ahoy rounds up, some of the team will come back to ARCs and Kyle will start working on the big art assets and things. Mm -hmm. But it's, it's, it's moving along. Yeah. Yeah, it's, uh, it's good in there. I'm, I'm, I'm watching the screen in fascination. So, hey, uh, is Ahoy going to be on Kickstarter? It will not. Yeah. It will not be on Kickstarter. Why, Patrick? Because uh, uh, cause I can print it. <laughs> <laughs> well, that, that's a good reason. That's a good reason. No, it, it's a it's a bit of work to set up a Kickstarter and to run one and to execute it well and to support people on it. So, I think with Ahoy and the size of the project it is, uh, it makes more sense for us to uh, just print directly into your pre-orders and, and deliver it directly. Yeah. Um, and then um, that you know that's like from our business mission statement or business plan. It is. It's about becoming reliable in all our income sources, and so I think for us, it is. It's valuable to be able to say, "Hey, if we do, uh, if we if we can do this game direct, then we can do this game direct." So, uh, the size is closer to four than I believe. The box size we're ordering is kind of around Riverfolk right now. Yeah, the yeah. box is like Riverfolk size, which is to say, right between <laughs> Root and Fort. Yeah. Yep. Um, it it will probably get released at a show. Like we'll have pre-orders and things. But yeah. One of the elements of its releases is it's going to be, you know, coming out hopefully at a show. I'm not sure exactly how we're going to do our pre-orders yet. There's a world where we do them before the show or after or some combination. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, that doesn't just doesn't really lend itself to running a crowdfunding campaign. Yeah. Um, and crowdfunding campaigns, in addition to the the, uh, the, the the creative bandwidth and the production bandwidth that they take up, I mean, there's just a lot of staff to, to do them well. It's like just throwing a gigantic party. You only get you only kind of get so many yeah, per year, yeah. and so we kind of want to use it on other projects. Yeah, that's what I was going to get there too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yep. So just 
I'm tired. I had a sinus headache. My first sinus headache in three weeks. So I'm glad it was my first one in three weeks. But. Sad it was last night. <laughs> Uh, yeah, and so ARCs will, ARCs with a C, by the way, uh, will be going to, uh, uh, Kickstarter. Um, I, we haven't really talked timeline for it yet. Yeah, I think right now what we're figuring it out, so we're actually creating, this is one thing I worked on this week, we're creating a kind of like floating schedule, which is, so what I mean by that is, it's a, basically a full schedule of everything that we have to do to launch the ARCs Kickstarter. Mm -hmm. And then we don't put dates on it, we just put distances in between all the benchmarks mm -hmm. and then we kind of set that like a transparency on top of a calendar and we're like okay do we want to be working on this stuff over Christmas well no obviously not so let's shift it a little bit back and so we're just trying to find like the right place to put it in the calendar but you know first half of the year um, thinking like late Q1 early Q2 but mm -hmm. it, we, we don't have a specific date yet uh, yeah, so the uh, ARCs playtesting, blind playtesting, I assume we're just going to open it like root, like you're at some yeah, point. We, we yeah, we will do, so if you playtested Oath, you'll probably get, some group of them will slowly get invites mm -hmm. to work on ARCs, uh, probably not until January or maybe early February. One of the things that I, I just, normally I open up my playtesting very early, with this project I'm waiting until yeah. the de design is like very, there's a very lot close. to do yeah and in the biggest reason why is like when you get your play testers it's like a like a furnace right and so as you work using the furnace it's going to gradually cool down and i want to make sure that we are applying our maximum force to the content that's being developed and so i just want to wait a little bit till later in the, in the process because it's a, it's just a, it's a tricky project i don't want to exhaust my play testers on the kind of like Another way to put this is, I always say that when you um, you should start playtesting when you feel like you don't know what the problem is with your game. Uh -huh. So as soon as you, you, you play the game, you're like, I don't see what, what the problem is. That's the time when you get playtesting. Yeah, yeah. And right now, I feel like I've got a good sense of where the design is not working and where it is working. And once we get a little further on into the content, that's when there'll be real questions that anyone may need help with. So in he... Um Cole also just walks through the office and says, I'm Cole Whirly. I don't need playtesting. Done with it. Over. Yeah, anytime you get in his way, you know, like if you're in front of him with the water. I don't, yeah, I don't need playtesting. Yeah, <laughs> it's it's pushes you aside. aside, yeah. It's a bit um, much. Uh, by the way, dibs on Gantt. Yeah, yeah, dibs on Gantt. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's, uh, so I, I want to do that one. Yeah, yeah. I am a um, man of many Gants. Um, <laughs> let's see here. Uh, do, 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 do. Um, Oath Expansion. This is an interesting subject. Yeah. I saw some discussion on BGG about it. Um, there are kind of like two different ways of doing an Oath Expansion. There's like a big box way, which we have ideas for. And there's also a small box, which would be like extra edifices, maybe a few more relics, some lands. Uh, you know, maybe another deck, but then that's like, that's a hard, that's and a hard ask. And way more pigs. Every, all, it's all pigs. It's all pigs. Yep. Um, one piece of art. <laughs> be real easy for Kyle, and then we just put it on every asset. Um, that the, the question about what Oath's expansion looks like and when it happens is still kind of an open question that will depend on the continued sales of the second printing. And so, what, basically, what we're doing is like I'm working on Arcs, and we're working on a Hoyan Studio, and Patrick's working on his game, which I'm sure he's going to talk more about presently. And while that's all happening, we are waiting to see. How is Marauder received? And we're right waiting to see how Oath is received. Now, Oath has already been received well enough that we will almost certainly be doing something for it in, in the future. But we're just kind of in a holding pattern, and while we're in that holding pattern, we're generating some other projects. Mm -hmm. And then we'll, we'll kind of make the call like halfway through next year about which thing gets expanded first and how we expand it. Mm -hmm. But I, I mean, you know, I remember right after Oath came out, people started, playtesters especially, started asking for more Oath content. And Nick looked at me dismayed and was like, there's just no way people have gotten through all the content in the base game yet. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, but I think now the game has been out long enough that people might start be getting mm -hmm. close to it. But it is like a game plus two expansions. So, you know, there's already plenty. I saw all the cards after seven games. Yes. Seven I just would throw out 30 cards and bring in 30 more. Yeah. yeah so I saw the game. game. Yep. Is that not what the rules are? No, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You, have, you have the early rules. Okay. <laughs> tell us about tell us about Dungeon Fortress. Uh, yeah. So Dungeon Fortress is my. I feel like 
it's it, it, there isn't like a language to talk about the game, which is so we maybe we need to figure that out is how we're going to sell this game. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I'm building a um, I'm building a game where if you look at like kind of the villains of a D and D campaign, mm-hmm. and then you're playing them, uh, and you are all fighting for control of a dungeon. Um, so you know maybe a little bit of like Dungeon Keeper, but not it, Dungeon Keeper was so like tactical. Mm-hmm. So like oh, I need to put a chicken farm here. I need to put a, a, a I need to put a um, uh, I need to put a trainer here, and it's 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 a lot. Like each space represents an entire dungeon, um, and uh, yeah, it's been it's been going well. Um, I, there's been some kind of seismic shifts in it recently, and like as my um, as how I think about the um, about how I think about game design. Frankly, I think I've been learning a lot in the last couple of months. It's been changing, so that's been good. Um, no Tecmo's Deception, that's a little bit too drilled in. Thank you for the <laughs> reference, though. Uh, and, uh, and so then the players are fighting fighting with each other uh, for control of the dungeon. And so there'll be kind of a, you know, maybe like, we'll shove a little anti-imperialist message in there. Yeah. Yeah, with the, them defending themselves from the, mm-hmm. from the overworld, the attacks from the overworld. There is a, um, there is a component of it that the player that's in the lead We'll start attracting adventures, and so then adventures will start. You know, mm-hmm. so a bit like Dungeon Lord, except again, zoomed out way, way more. Yeah. yeah. So the, the the adventures will just be another army on the table, and they will uh, they'll come around and disrupt your uh, disrupt your dungeon, and mess up your stuff for you. Um, yeah. So I'm working on that. It's kind of a it's a bit of a, a scrum or grab the brass ring kind of thing because it's when you have five or more territories, you score the most points, but then your society falls apart a little bit. Um, otherwise, it is uh, very much a Civ game. Um, you're spending your uh, tech advances, essentially, either gaining a new captain, which will, uh, which will be represented in another miniature on the board. Mm-hmm. And that, I'm sorry, I'm talking really fast. I'm uh, caffeinated because yeah. of the because of sleep. So you'll get another you'll you get another captain on the board who can support troops um, uh, moving moving across the table with them. Or you'll get a new type of, um, right now we're calling them rooms, or they're buildings essentially in a Civ game. So you'll get a new type of rare building that you can build in your dungeon. Mm-hmm. That's unique to you. And that also contributes to how much territory you control. And so um, uh, and so there's been a lot of great like thinking about, like, you know, do you tech up? Do you build? Mm-hmm. Do you build? Do you, uh, do, you, do you try and control territory? And I'm trying to make all three of those work together right now. So... So the big thing that we're doing right now is we're dropping. Uh, now we're gonna call it dark. Dunk's pretty good though. Um, pretty good. I think I'm really I'm really on dark right now. Um, yeah. Dufo, Dufo also. Is good. <laughs> <laughs> that will get some attention. Um, and uh, so right now the work is going into. Currently the map is rep. Is, I've tried two map approaches where. Um, and we can talk about map later. That's see, it's right there later in it. Well, we can talk about it. We can talk about it now. So uh, recently, I've been working on. Yeah, how are we doing? We're doing great. Oh, uh, we're doing great. Yeah. Okay. So recently, I've been working on kind of a hex map version of it, just as like a mm-hmm. just something to sit in while we're working on the uh, while working on it. But you know, that reminds you of other games, like other games. Yeah. Hexes. Yeah. Uh, and so then I tried a version of the map that where it's uh, the dungeon is represented by uh, square tiles on risers. And so they can be at different heights, and the the way that those interact is interesting. Um, it, that's gonna be a lot to build. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, it looks cool, but it doesn't really add a lot to the game. So um, what I'm experimenting right now, which I'd have brought a picture with me, is um, you'll just get a large square grid, kind of like in block, mm-hmm. and then um, you will build. Um, you'll start with a three by three piece in one of the in, mm-hmm. in one of the and one of the grid spaces, and that has four four slots for rooms in it. Mm-hmm. And then you can tunnel away from it, and then there will be other mm-hmm. smaller rooms you can, or dungeons you can dig into. And you can expand them, or you can continue digging. Mm-hmm. There'll be kind of a default map, though, so you don't have to expand too much. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, so now the economy is moving away from having stone to build and having just, like, hammers or something, and the hammers will represent mm-hmm. how much digging you can do each turn. Um, so Cave Evil has yeah 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 it has it's like a big wheel so there's a center room and then there's long tunnels in the starting room yeah there's long tunnels in the starting room yeah yeah but when you dig in Cave Evil you don't know what you're digging into so you then you like you're digging and then you reveal a card and it's like as a long tunnel yep and then you just put a long tunnel on the map and so the map kind of has this weird organic 
like fractally. Organic is a great way to describe that game, anyway. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> since you're building, um, uh, since you're building followers from yeah, from dead followers, yeah, really essentially. Followers. <laughs> yeah. Now, what I like about Dark so far, and I think this is true of Arcs too, is like they're both. We've been working in and around strategy war games for now like years. Yeah. And I think both of the games are like stepping back and thinking about like the fundamentals of the form a little bit. Yeah. Uh, and then that that is also like very freeing in a way that can be very scary. Right. Because it means that like anything is on the table. Right. Yeah. I mean, if you want, if you you want generals, okay, we can put generals in. Yeah. But, yeah. And so like the yeah, adventures of them. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Adventures, but like you know, if we're thinking about um, should the map be three D, what does that really add? I mean, that that's like a very fundamental question right. about. Like how the game looks, what you know, how strategy games comport themselves, and things mm-hmm. like that. Um, it's really cool. Though. It's very exciting. I think what's going to happen is probably we'll be talking about it, you know, in these kinds of chats for many more months, and then we're hoping to have a lot to show, like over the summer and into the fall. Yeah, and really get people on board with with what it's doing. So that that's like kind of the rough pacing of the schedules. Yeah, uh, yeah, and the combat system. I'll just I'll just get I'll get pumped about the combat system because it's it's awesome. The I'm combat like, system is my favorite combat system that the studio has generated. Oh, that means a it's bit. good. It's really good. Oh, it's because good. my oath is pretty cool. So um, <laughs> it's, it is such a clean, smart combat system. I think it's great. Uh, yeah. So it looks like I'm leaning towards miniatures because I like the big, you know, yeah, I like the big production. Uh, I, I I also oh. like miniatures for it. Because I think, yeah. yeah, yeah, and I think it's going to be like a bigger, like an oath size production. Although the, these are, we're we're early in this. Conversation. Yeah, 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 yeah. But but I do think that this is a title that I think like no minis make make yeah. sense for, um, and that really is like, it's a really important test that we put all of our products through, which is like what type of production actually helps the game, mm-hmm. as opposed to just saying like, well, the people want miniatures, so we got to put miniatures yeah. and everything. It's yeah. like we yeah, we don't. But arcs will be, I believe, arcs. You're leaning probably on. would maybe yeah. acrylic. We're like optioning some acrylic pieces potentially. Yeah. But like the the way arcs art direction goes is that the actual player pieces are somewhat simple because the art is in other places in the design. Yeah. Um, yep. uh, oh, and then I saw uh, two comments. One about the merch survey. Super helpful. I'll just echo the comment of the Brooke, of, of Brooke who put it in the chat. Uh, the merch survey was amazing. Thank you for your free labor. We have samples of lots of cool things, which we'll probably share with you next month or sometime soon. But they turned out fabulous, and I'm excited to show you all more. And then somebody asked that said they had a group that's a little resistant to playing out. They're having trouble uh, not knowing the right way to introduce people to it. Uh, what I'll tell you is that if your group is not super into playing Oath, try don't don't make them. Uh, it's just it requires buy-in, uh, and I think that's really important. If if you do think that they would love it, and if, if there's interest, um, one of the best tricks is if you know the game well, um, when you're teaching it, cut the supply in half and give them half the number of actions for the first round or two, just so you can get them used to the flow of the game. Um, but outside of that, like treating it, I would say cater to whatever your group normally likes. If, if and, and this is especially useful if you have a group. Of players that likes role playing games, you can lean into those elements of both. If they t- tend to like, you know, str- more traditional strategy games, you can lean into those those elements as well. But uh, you know, nothing re- revelatory. But just I think Oath, more than anything else that the studio has produced, just it just requires a lot of consent and buy in. And so you want to make sure to, to, to get that. At a local con, somebody ran Ti as a role playing event. See, that's and and he stood up and gave a speech during the political phase okay and you could tell the other players were just like i just want to play a ti right now and i do not want to listen to this guy talking it's i i sim- <laughs> I, I, I sympathize with both the players and the person giving the speech John, John <laughs> Company had, so i don't i don't role play that much anymore i used to but only ever as the dm and i think there are different uh, pattern knows as well there are different schools of how people role play like do you speak in character or do you narrate like a book i narrate like a book that is how i've always done it but I, I write, I'm probably in the minority. Uh, I have no idea. I don't really think I like, about it that I way. Think, yeah. you know, it was like shared, shared story. 
Uh, but you know, a draft of John Company many months ago had this rule for the voting phase that the prime minister player who runs the voting phase had to grant you the floor so that you could speak. Nice. And it was just so it was just to regulate the voting. So I didn't yeah. I didn't mean for players to make speeches. Right. But players would always interpret that rule like, oh well, if I'm granted the floor, I better say something of why I want to cast my votes. And so the political phase took way too long. It was being people were being very silly because because of that stuff. Um, I tend to I tend to describe the player's experience in the world down to the their sensation, the character's sensation, mm. but not their interpretation. And sometimes people get mad at me when I it's like one time I was described this character had a very good sense of smell, so I was describing his conclusions that you wouldn't be able to make as a human from mm-hmm. what he can smell. And he was like, "Well, let me make my own conclusion." I'm like, well. That's what you smell. Yeah, it's, yeah. It's, I don't yeah, know. Okay. I, I think, yeah, I, and it, it has also been long enough that I, I don't even know what my, what my feelings are about t- role-playing games. It's just been a long time since I've played. You shot my trail. All right. Um, okay, so, moving on. Uh, PAX Unplugged. Leader Games is going to PAX Unplugged, sort of. Well, no, we are going to PAX Unplugged. Yeah, we are definitely going to, to PAX Unplugged. Um, and, uh, the staff is very excited to see folks. Uh, we're going to be doing it a little bit differently. For one, um, only the operations team is going. So the creative staff will be staying in St. Paul or wherever they're based. Uh, and this isn't because we don't love you. Uh, but it, it, it is because we just happen to be working on a number of projects right now that like kind of need to get done. And PAX Unplugged is always at a funny time of year because if you go to PAX Unplugged, you have like a week and then it's Christmas and then it's New Year and you kind of just like lose the month. Mm-hmm. And so the operations team, because they're, they're hustling right now to get everything ready for Christmas mm-hmm. and for all the Christmas sales, the operations team is like better suited to do packs Unplugged than the creative team. And so just for this specific year, uh, it just so happens that the operations team will be going and creative was going to be staying here working. Um, but, uh, and then the other big thing that's going to be different about this year's PAX Unplugged is that we're not going to do demos yeah. for obvious reasons that I would have to go into. Um, uh, we are going to do demos. We will have copies of most of our games for sale. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I actually, we're like astoundingly well stocked for leader games. We have so. never gone into a Christmas season <laughs> with stock like we have. And, so, and I'm not saying our sales have flagged. We just are astoundingly far ahead of the curve uh, getting ready for the... Um, usually we just get stuff in. We just right out the door. But this time we were able to get a little bit of everything in and, yeah. and hold on to it. So, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm sure it is going to be a blast. I love PAX Unplugged. It's one of my favorite shows. Um, and I, I think it's going to be a good time. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, please please do stop by and say, I think we might have merch, too. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not sure about that. That we will talk about that in December. Brooke can tell us. Yeah. All right. There's a world for how we're going to be doing merch. I don't know how much we can treat all this like uh, not quite hearsay, but also not an official announcement. One option for how we're thinking about doing merch is having like at a con, you know, a display of what we can offer, and then you go online and order. Yeah. The 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 size and color and things like. Because then we can give much better options and sizes. Yeah, hundred yeah. percent. And we can offer much cooler stuff. Um, yeah, it's yeah. just so like t-shirts at cons, y'all. It's kind of the worst because by halfway through the first morning, all the boxes are messed up, and so someone asks you for like an XL, and you're just digging around, and you like stumble into a vast shirt that's four years old that happened to end up in that box. Um, it's not great, and then people are shouting at you. So this is going to be a, probably better for everyone. Uh, okay, so yes, I've been given the update. <laughs> okay, we're not supposed to be talking about merch. No, no, stuff. actually, uh, we have a ten by twenty booth where I'm putting all this merch stock, all in caps, mm-hmm. and then teary face. So apparently, we're supposed to have known. <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, okay. Well. All right. <laughs> oh, we have no space. Oh, where am I putting the stock? Okay, we won't have any stock. Don't be no merch. So yeah, well, there's yeah, no merch at Pax Unplugged. Sorry, I knew I knew that. No merch at Pax Unplugged, but we may have things to peek at. Yes, that you could then order. But so. yeah, you, yeah. Sorry, sorry, Brooke. <laughs> sorry, Brooke. Yeah, uh, how do I tell Brooke I love her without you know, HR? Um, okay, so uh, all right, the next thing on our list to talk about is the uh, Root Winter Tournament. So uh, every, not every year, 
year. But last year they did it, and maybe they did it the year before. I think South Philly have done two. I think they've done two. Uh, Leader Games sponsors a tournament that is run by the... Uh, why do I want to say Garrick Makes Games is the name of this chat? That's not right. It's Garrick Stream, uh, and he runs it through like partial Just collaboration last with the Woodland Warriors Discord. It is an excellent stream, like the best root players, so much better than me. Uh, and Patrick and I last year got to comment on the last game and provide some color commentary. It was a lot of fun. Was that that tournament? I thought it was the... I think so. Well, I think we did it twice last year. Okay, that's all right. Good. Um, anyway, it's a blast. And it is uh, hosted... Yeah, Garrick Samples Games. Thank you. That was the... I was missing the verb. Uh, and it's all run out of that Twitch. Uh, games are usually on weekends. The very first game is going to be this Friday at sometime in the afternoon or evening. Uh, and then all the games, of course, are you can, you can see them for pre previous games on the Twitch channel. They're eventually migrated to their YouTube as well. Um, it is a lovely, uh, it's a lovely event, and uh, I'm so excited about it this year. Because we are going to be full, or they are going to be folding in the new advanced, both the new advanced setup rules and the new factions. So the Keepers and Iron and the Lord of the Hundreds will both be featured as part of the tournament, and they're going to be using the new advanced setup rules. So to celebrate that, the kicking off of the tournament, uh, and signups are closed. They're not accept, uh, they're not accepting new contestants or anything. I, candidates. I voted candidates. anonymously as ocular pig. Oh. Uh, uh, uh. <laughs> <laughs> you just wear a little mask. Um, but they're going to be uh, using uh, all the new stuff, or not almost all the new stuff. And so I thought that uh, to kind of celebrate the start of the tournament, we would talk a little bit about the advanced draft. Yeah, let's do it. Um, I have in front of me, in addition to our agenda, a little uh, readout. This was posted on Garrick's Twitter of the rules modifications, which is basically... Um, they are doing one very small. Uh, oh, actually, there are, not, Patrick, there are the a few adjustments. Um, so I'll just go through them quickly. They use a modified advanced setup, which we'll talk about in a bit. Uh, the map, uh, auto map, is always randomized clearings, and then on the mountain map, they're dropping the tower and replacing it by the lost city, which is a bold move. So the tower is a victory point for the winner, uh, the ruler of that clearing. Very simple. I feel like they just stab me in the heart. I know. Patrick Love loves this tower. The Lost City is the clearing that is every suit. Now, the Lost City has created, for, to my, for my money, the most memorable games for root I've ever played, where it becomes such an important clearing that, like, tens of warriors are killed to try and dislodge the person who has it. It's great, but I'm very interested to see. I, I don't think... I, I know it has been tested on the mountain map a couple times, but I don't think I was in those games. Um, okay. Faction balance. Um, just a couple small notes about the Vagabond. The infamy scoring for the tournament will be done one point, no matter how many pieces are killed. Sure. And then uh, coalitions, of course, disallowed for tournament. Again, obvious reasons. Okay, let's talk about advanced setup. So, to help with this... Because there was a three-way tie at one of the rounds yeah, last year. Just, it's not a good look. It's not a good look for anybody. Uh, okay, so, I... I was wondering why I had this set up here. Look at this. Oh, look at oh, oh, no. Let's make sure I didn't break the string. Nope, looks all right. Uh, okay, so... Here we have the advanced setup cards. There they are. I will try to keep an eye on this so I don't Once mess it up. you got Um... <laughs> So the way advanced setup works is all games in the tournament. So this isn't how. I'm sorry, these are the modified tournament modified rules for advanced setup. I'm just going to go through it quickly. So first, all games will use exiles and partisans, and then you will deal these setup cards. So the way these work is you deal um, one more than there are players. So let's say we have four players. This is an unhelpful camera angle. Sorry. Uh, so let's say we have four players. We're going to deal five of these cards. What is this? The war? What is happening? Wow! Look at this amazing all. Uh, this amazing. Cole is assuming I can read that far away. Well. Oh, okay. So don't I see. Worry, don't worry. Don't worry. So the way these advanced setup cards work is some of them have a little sword on and a red banner on the advanced setup. And what that means is that it's a militant faction. So you'll see the keepers and iron. They rate as a militant faction. Vagabond does not raise a militant faction. And there's an exception to these rules which basically says if there aren't any militant factions out here, 
um, the last of the insurgents gets locked so that until one militant faction is drafted, you can't pick this one. Now, that obviously didn't happen here. Now, the way this works is uh, after the set of cards are dealt, we seat the players and everybody gets five cards. Five cards. Five cards. <laughs> um, and then uh, player one is going to choose the map. And then players are going to go in turn order and they're going to choose and set up their factions. And then after all the factions have been chosen, you take your hand of five cards and you draft down to three cards. The remaining cards are shuffled into the deck and uh, well, you know, and all the discards are shuffled into the deck and the game's ready to play. Uh, so when you go into a draft, you know, like, you know, if you have a hand of full of bird cards, the cats can become a bit more appealing. Now, the biggest difference here is the moment you draft a faction, you are going to set up that faction. And they go right on the board. And so to give you an example, we've got... What are my choices here? Yeah, so we've got... Okay, so here's the flop. We got Erie. We got the Duchy. Keepers and Iron. Vagabond. Lord of the Hundreds. Wow, look at that. Yeah, now the Vagabond is kind of a strong pick in a lot of these drafts. Oh, and one... Oh, no. Well, okay. I can't do it here because I didn't import the deck. When you flop a Vagabond, you also deal a random Vagabond. So this isn't like the Ranger or whatever you think the yeah, top yeah. tier Vagabond is. Probably the Harrier or mm, the Badger, right? My Harrier's pretty good and the Badger I don't think is very good. Oh, you guys. Okay. I think um, I, I, I think the I think Harrier, the, the Harrier and the basic the base three, the the Tinker, the the Thief and yeah, the, the Tinker. Um, so and the Ranger are good. You may have your favorite Vagabond, but when the Vagabond appears in this draft, you take a random uh, Vagabond and put it on the card. Which, quick, like, um, talking design-wise, one of the goals of Advanced Setup was to give players a door to, to enter to play Root that would help you pl play all of your content without you having to pick. So doing things like shuffle all the Vagabonds, deal one, is a way of saying, hey, you're going to play with all your Vagabonds, not just, like, the two that you think are best, mm -hmm. right? Uh, because you might discover things about the game that you didn't know. Um, yeah, I think the Harrier's Glide is super strong. Uh, but in this instance, even if the Harrier was on this flop, I don't know if I'd pick the Vagabond. And that's just because these are... So, I mean, the Keepers, Lord of the Hundreds, and the Eerie, and the Underground Duchy are all going to give the Vagabond some serious problems. Just making sure that's all on the page. Now, one thing about this setup it, that's very different from the old way of setting up in Root is that when you draft this card, you f do your setup steps. You go through all those steps and you set up the board. Um, so the Eerie Dynasties, for instance, the first step is you get to choose your homeland clearing. It has to be on a map edge. It has to be at least two clearings away, uh, two clearings between it and enemy homelands. Now, if there are no enemy homelands on the board, and homeland is a setup specific word that just means a clearing that was chosen by another player. And, you know, and but it doesn't have any game meaning in the actual game. Uh, the Eerie, if they were picked, if I draft Eerie first, so, you know, normally I wouldn't say Eerie is a tier one pick here. But one of the advantages of picking Eerie first is that you can set up anywhere. You can pick any clearing on the edge mm -hmm. because all of them are valid. And then that can also be used to box players into weird, weird situations. Um, the, the cats have one of my favorite advanced setups because they can pick three connected clearings for their homeland, but they can be anywhere. So they could, if you're playing the mountain map and the cats are in the draft, you can put your keep in that clearing that is all colors. Mm -hmm. And this is going to happen, Garrick. I hope you know what you've done by putting the lost city on the mountain map. Because a cat is going to have the most powerful field hospitals imagined. Imaginable. Oh, sure. And th this is what leads to the big fights for the middle. Although, uh, the main thing, uh, it, it's very useful. It's almost like a soft buff for the cats, but it uh, it can be a disaster for them, too. Because they, they can they can. I'm not sure that. It's a good sandbag. It's funny that we had started out playtesting, uh, being able to play senior on the edge, and planned this all out several years ago. But we just made people place in the corners. So they mm -hmm. appreciate it now. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Was, was Sometimes really nice. you're like, you, you do all of the all of the rigmarole of advanced setup, and you're like, oh, it looks like a regular game. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, uh, Patrick, let's say you're drafting first in a four player game. Uh, I'm going to go, I mean, really, really, if I was trying to win this game, I'd play the Vagabond. But let's go with the Lord of the Hundreds. 
I I think with this pairing, I think Keeper is the hardest pick on the board. Yep. I think I I think the moles would be hard too. Moles in games with lot with lots of insurgent factions, you can get away with doing small mole. <laughs> with this one, I think you're gonna get you get boxed in too much. Um I would probably pick Ooh, Lord of the Hundreds, maybe Eerie. All right, well, let's see what happens when you pick Lord of the Hundreds. Yeah, so if I pick Lord of the Hundreds, doop, right, then we're going to go through these set of instructions. So you pick your homeland clearing. They're on a map edge, too. So oftentimes, the first player to pick is going to then determine kind of like the orientation of the board. Mm -hmm. um, they drop their Warlord, the Four Warriors, the Stronghold in that, home, uh, in that homeland. They get the Stubborn Mood card. And then they see see the ruins, um, and so interestingly, like you know, rules about like the seating of the ruins they've been folded into these setup cards. Mm -hmm. So the actual setup for ruins gotten a lot simpler. Um, yeah, and I don't. I mean, in this instance, I think this is gonna be a very full map uh, in any re any regard. Okay, let's do another one. I just want to talk through some different, sure, especially yeah. one that's a little bit heavier on insurgents. Mm -hmm. we'll, we'll see if if fortune favors us. Uh, I'll shuffle this again, though. Okay. So here we've got Lord of the Hunt. Oh my God, it's the same. <laughs> uh, another vagabond. Well, there's two. Right. Okay. So, ooh, all right. This is not so different. I feel like from one of the last games of the tournament last year. So we have Lord of the Hundreds and the the Duchy, um, and then Lizard Cult, Vagabond, Riverfolk Company. Okay, so Lizard Call, there have been a few very small alterations to how the setup works. One of the things that the setup do, advanced setup does is it permits really wild game states. And to, to help deal with that, some of the setups have slightly buffed some of the factions. So the Lizards, for instance, start with two Acolytes in their, um, in their, their box. Two Warriors in their Acolyte box. I think the Lizards are like a tier one pick here. Uh, and it's because... The river folk is in the game. Yep. The vagabond is in the game. Yep. And the lizards can be can take over underground duchy buildings and cause problems there. Yep. And the warlord is going to be wanting to conquer stuff anyway and really clear you well, out. Well, you, you want to, the warlord to hit you. Yeah. So you, you, yeah. I mean, the, the warlord has and he to, has to the, hit you to clear out clearings. Yeah. So I, I think I think the lizards are kind of kind of tier one here. Uh, did you see my awesome? Online play of the lizards, where I completely I had a I had a red, the red dominance card in my hand start of the game, mm -hmm. and I played the entire game with it in my hand, and then I was like just sandbagging red the whole game, and then like the badger got wail on one turn, and I forgot to play it during that turn. Oh no! So because he would have had to step out of the game, and I would have handily won, and I just. Sailed right into a loss. Lizard dominance is a is a tough one to do, but it can, it can work because you have to get those ten points. I wrote right it. Oh, yeah, I was I was well, I was I was a commanding lead. Uh, what did someone say? Um, oh, so someone says uh, Rudy Smash is coming out around March, right? Probably around March. It's uh, maybe like shipping March April. It's super hard to know right now. We it are is, we are in the middle of the most strange sorry I'm interrupting no, no 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 go ahead Tell it, us I mean it. like every like so there there are 200,000 containers at uh, Long Beach right now in California uh, backed up the president has taken two steps to fix that one of which is being the customs union now has to work past five o'clock <laughs> and uh, Long Beach apparently had a policy where they couldn't stack containers that were too high that when because of the view yeah, that is the craziest thing I've ever heard. Uh, so they were like, we're going to let the U.S. economy tank because some people don't work past five, and uh, which we can pay over time. But like, and, so and you can't stack up containers. One big reason why we have any stock of anything for the holidays is because Marshall has been working like day and night to get things to us, our operations um, yeah. manager. And that included like putting things on trucks to truck across the country. Normally, we would, we would wait for trains, but yeah. the, the trains are full right now. And so, it has been so hard to move anything from point A to point B. But Marauder, uh, Marauder was like largely finished on time in terms of schedule. It's just the production is, t is taking a little bit longer. Yeah. Um, we're hoping that we have it all through production before Chinese New Year and on the boat. But it's it's hard. To, it's super I, hard. To it, it, it's it's not. Yeah. So it's the it's the containers, 
China is scaling back on power production right now to hit their global emissions, which is good for them, but it's also going to slow their factories down. Um, paper supply was challenging. Um, Panda's been very busy. And you, everything, you know, everything's just a little backed up anyway, and every, every, every delay there can, can throw us off a month. So we're doing our best, uh, and I, I, think, I think we'll be surprised, or I think we'll be happy with where we come in, but it's, uh, we're, we're working our way through right now. Yeah. So. Uh, I think officially it, though. That rules question about yeah, um, SP Shaman is is correct, and, and likewise for Lily um, about where where the dead otters go. Um, yeah, this is a really interesting game. I feel like for me, like lizards are tier one pick, otters are maybe tier two, and then maybe Dutchy. I don't, well, I don't know if Agron it is so. Yeah, I don't. I mean, this is the, the Vagabond. Like, could, 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 it depends on the one that's drawn. I should have ported those Vagabond cards. Um, these will be hopefully on the uh, the root. Some of the root TTS mods will have these advanced setup cards soon. All right, we're gonna do one more, and then we're gonna move to. to the oh next yeah, one. yeah. So Vendetta there has a question about the rules. Probably a question posted in the forums. So oh, they answered it. Though. Oh, okay, good. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. To their supply. Yeah, Ooh, that, okay. That actually yeah. would have been my answer. So. Man. Here we go. Look at this. So th this is all, this is a very interesting situation here, uh, potentially. We're, we're 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 good, but this is a more of a high insurgent draft. It occurred to me that like the next expansion needs a couple of insurgents. Well, that was my fault. I put in two militant actions. Well, it's good. It's good. It's good. It's good. We have three. I frankly, I think the. I, I think I dived in a grenade for you there. I think the no. Militant Months are hard. I, I think the Militant Months are much harder. Okay. So uh, in this one, so the, here, here's, a, here's a table. we got Lizard Cult, the Conspiracy, the Riverfolk Company, the Eerie, and the Underground Duchy. Mm. This one's harder. Well, I'm going to throw you all off and okay, pick the birds. You take the birds. I love them. Birds are just See, I just never play the birds, so that's why. I'm, that's why I'm sorry. I'm just, I'm just messing with you. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I really mean, like playing otters because I, uh, I, you know, you know me. I like doing business in the real world, and and uh, yeah. and the otters are close to that. <laughs> um, yeah, this is this is an interesting one. I think that the, the the lizards are probably in a good spot. The moles, the moles are tricky because I think you have to just be really disciplined when you're playing the moles and know when you're going to jump and when you're going to make your risks, uh, which which I have a hard time doing because I tend to think, like, if I can make my, my splash, I'll just do it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and so I don't, sometimes I don't have the patience to play the moles well. Yeah, I play very differently because I just play the, I play the less risky build all mm -hmm. the time and then go for it at the end. Yeah, I, um, I often, like, there's... The, there's a principle I have when it, when it comes to design, which is that um, I like working on games where the second best player finishes in last. Mm -hmm. And so uh, to tr I, I always find myself taking these huge swings where I'm like, oh, there's a one in four chance I win this game. Yeah, yeah. And then if I fail, it's just everything. It's ash. The, uh -huh. the game of life has lesson. Because <laughs> game of life, right? You can yeah. just you can you can even roll it and bet all and one in five chance you'll spin the game when you get to the end instead right. of, instead, yeah. of playing, instead of playing through instead of playing through it. Yep. Um, okay. Cool. That's the only time I'll talk about the game of life. In front right, of well, you. I'm sorry. No, no. no <laughs> I, we have fulfilled our game of life quota for the next two years. Okay, so that's not, seems, not that's seems fair. Um, okay. Uh, do you want to talk more about the dark map? Or no, I'm like, good. I'm good. Let's. Really? I mean, we only have like ten. I'm, yeah, we, ten minutes. We can go to three oh five. That's right? true. Let's give the people what they want. All right. Q and A. I'm having no, fun let today. Me, let me go. This is the only fun I've had all week. It's only a Tuesday. I loved trick or treating with my donor on Sunday night. It's so fun. It was amazing. Yeah, it was so good. We, I feel like the part of St. Paul that we live in is, it's like the best Halloween of any place I've ever lived. It's so good. Like my neighborhood, lots of people who do fires in their front yard, lots of mulled wine, just just kids the everywhere. Summit had all these great like decorations and yeah. yeah I took I, some photos, but yeah. Yeah, I love, I love Halloween in the my only concern was that teenagers kept walking up to me without any masks on. I was like, Ugh. so without like the not just like on my room. porch. Okay, and then they were like in my because we had a tube, but they'd come up to the door because I, I was see. there to meet them. So we had a tube. We would put candy down. It was great. We handed out seventy full size candy bars. Hell yeah! Yeah, it was great. Uh, and then somebody, and then somebody stole twenty. And man, necromancer pooping your stockings for Christmas. We uh, when we got so we, we did the big bowl 
and then we left with, to play with the kids and you know to, to party with the grown ups yeah and then when we came back later that night our giant bowl was empty except there were two loose M&M's yeah nice and a fake fingernail ooh which is perfect it was like I wanted to take a photo of it it was like uh-huh. just a perfect <laughs> <case. laughs> Or how's this in Q&A, though? Yeah, here, yeah. Uh, so ask us your questions, whatever you want to know about. We're happy to talk about any games that we're working on or things that we're playing or, or whatever. You've been kind of asking the whole time, but... I know. We, yeah. We, you know, we didn't... I, I feel like when we try to bring up all the questions, they, they because the, the questions happen in this flow of the conversations, it's hard to do. Yeah, I know. Um, ooh, all right. Um, uh, so this person asks, I mentioned uh, Merchants and Marauders and Zia to get a feel of what was out there before designing, how to influence your design, uh, what did you not like or not like about it. Uh, so uh, Nick and I, over the summer, we were I was working on ARCs and then Nick was working on Ahoy, and we realized that both of these games have modes or elements where you have a single ship exploring mm-hmm. an open world. Mm-hmm. And at a certain point we were like, oh, well, there's like a whole genre of games <laughs> that, that are about this. Like Magic Realm. Like Magic Realm. Um, but we, we looked at, especially at Merchants and Marauders, which we didn't play, we were at the rules. And I, I, I played it in the past. Um, and then also uh, we looked at Zia. Now, Merchants and Marauders, I think, is a fine game. And I actually, like, I think it's designed by, is it Martinson? Is that his name? Christopher Martinson. Also designed Clash of Cultures, which both of those games, I think, are, are well built. But neither one is like anywhere near my favorite game, and it's because they're, they're they're just part of a design tradition that I don't really care for, which is the I really loved Sid Meier's growing up, and I wish to directly transcribe that experience to a board game. Mm-hmm. So, Mercy and Marauders is obviously Sid Meier's is Pirates. Clash of Cultures is so Sid Meier's Civilization, mm-hmm. and I just think that the video game versions are better. Although the new edition of Clash of Cultures is pretty good, and I, I had fun. I played it with with my, uh, with some friends recently so it's I, I think I think the person is a very good designer it's just that he's not working on things that interest me too much now Zia on the other hand I'm obsessed with I think it's great <laughs> um, Zia uh, the very first thing that happened I, I taught Nick how to play it and we were playing and he flew into a nebula and had all of his energy zapped Mm-hmm. And he said, wait, do I have to lose all my energy? And I said, the rules say you have to lose all your energy and you have to slowly drift back to the space station. And he looked so disappointed. He looked at his ship and he looked at me. He looked at his ship and he looked at me and he said, well, I think I love this game. <laughs> um, and it just it like, it like just takes all these risks. Uh-huh. Uh, and it's a lot more like a story. It's a more, uh, to me, people ask, like, what would Tales of the Arabian Nights look like if designed today? And I think about like Zia. What would it look like if it was fun? Uh, so Zia has, um, Zia, that, that has the High Frontier, no, yeah, High Frontier, has that moment where you're like, oh, part of my ship blew up, and I'm gonna have to come back and rescue these people. This, I, Nick and I have the same experience, where I'm just like, neat. Yes. (laughs) So some of the game's, like, not about winning, but the fact that, like, there's ice slowly freezing your ship every turn, Uh and can you careen across this, like, part of the map and get to a safe spot to heal? And uh, I think the way that, and the other thing I'll say about it is um, the rules, it has one of the wildest rules documents of any game I've ever read, which is, like, the rules are not ordered in any kind of logical way. Mm-hmm. It, it, it's as if it's saying like this game is a modular expansion to itself because it's just like the rules are in these like little funny pods sure. it's very weird um, but it reminded me just in terms of how it like uses dice of Duel of Ages which is a game I, I, I like quite a bit mm-hmm. um, the biggest thing it impacted though is it changed how for arcs it changed how I was working on distance mm-hmm. because early drafts of the arcs map were very oathy mm-hmm. very everything it's space everything's connected to everything else mm-hmm. right and um and what, what I discovered with Zia is that the map in Zia is so expressive. It's so cool how the map works. And uh, I wanted the, the map to be more bottlenecky and have a lot more character. So I went into Ark saying, what if I took a map that basically, like, when we, if you compare uh, Oath and Root, um, the Oath map is content de- dependent. So all of the different regions. Uh, the primary thing that makes them different is the power of the region and the cards that are out there, so the content of the region. And Root's map generally is much more context-dependent. So what is it next to? 
doesn't really like all the regions. I mean, they they have, all the clearings have different characters. You know, they have different suits that they're part of. But mostly, it's context that's determining it. And so, what I wanted to do with arcs is find a map system that married those two and that was both content and context dependent and Zia showed me like a potential path now arcs does arcs does not have a big hex map uh the map for arcs is maybe 50 percent larger than roots map not in size but in terms of distance and that gives me enough jaggedness and then that that map building was very important in arcs mm -hmm. and i think nick i don't want to put words in his mouth but one of the things that he's told me before about playing Zia a few times with us was Zia helped him realize how much design you could do just spatially mm -hmm. or like just by just adjusting a couple numbers and not thinking about systems, mm -hmm. but just thinking about like how much you can do in content. I think as a studio, we tend to desi really design systems and then the, the content kind of often comes later. Mm -hmm. And Zia is such a content first design yeah, sure. and so I think uh, when Nick started really developing Ahoy and being like, "Oh, if I put these strong currents so they generally point off of my hex tiles and not on them, mm -hmm. it like pushes the map out in different directions." Mm -hmm. And so, that, uh, like, th there's some lovely inefficiencies that are built into the way Ahoy's map works, and that are like straight from the Book of Zia. Sure. Um, yeah. So that's some Zia thoughts. I, and I will, Bad Horse, I will agree that Zia's rulebook, I found the game very easy to learn from the rulebook. Mm -hmm. So it's like, it's a very inelegant object, but it also does its job super well. So I like Ahoy's map because sometimes you get trapped. In the you corner. get straight stuck. Straight stuck in the corner, and it's funny. <laughs> I, I love Ahoy's map is one of my favorite modular maps. You can't you know. really you can't really get stuck. Everybody, you say a lot. You, you can't get stuck, but it creates like dead. You feel far away, despite yeah. the fact that you have an ability. Everybody has an ability in Ahoy to like straight teleport across the map. You will feel far away. The last time we played it, there was this like string of tailwinds. Is that what they're called? Yeah. That took you to this like or currents or something. Currents. Yeah. It took you to this like this no man's land. They were all like kind of like staring each other down. Like someone's gonna have to go down there and get those points, but who's gonna do it? Kind of yeah. kind of moment. And I, I really like that. So um, I do, in fact, have a Google Pixel Four A. Uh -huh. It's my the screen got its first crack, and I'm very sad. This is the first new phone I've ever owned. I always own weird old used phones. I'm, I am actually currently waiting for the five or six, whatever I think the ones. Five's out, maybe. Yeah. I don't know. Anyway, I love this phone. I love that the battery lasts for a bunch of days. I, I have the great. Samsung Ten, and it is the biggest piece of garbage I've ever owned, and I hate it. <laughs> yeah. I, it like literally, you will hit a key on the touchpad, and it'll be like you might. Get the one you wanted. I have, although I, I always have to preface my phone opinions by saying like I'm the opposite of a phone power user. Mm -hmm. Like this phone has the Twitter app on it, and that's like it in a calculator and a podcast app and Audible. <laughs> it's a nerd phone, is what I'm trying to say. Um, uh, how do I get into Caves of Cud? Dedication? No. What you um, what you should do is if you go to YouTube. There are some there there are people who've done beginner guides and I think there's an like a, the, a person named Caitlin who might be one of the community moderators made a mod for beginners that's pretty good and like will help you teach. The but, game. but you would have got like three hundred hours in before you even like got anywhere, right? Yeah, not like twenty or thirty. Like I don't oh know, okay, like, okay. I, yeah, not 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 a ton, but I would say like um, so they've actually if you haven't played it recently, Case of Cud, the new version that just came out has lots of good UI improvements. It has different modes, including a more traditional computer you, you, RPG. Yeah, mode. I agree with that. Yeah, yeah. Um, There's that. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So there is, yeah, the latest update. Yes, yeah, super friendly beginners. The computer RPG mode, which is called like role play, saves your game in every town. So it kind of stops it from being a roguelike in yeah. the traditional way. Um, but it does allow you to like progress through the plot. They also have a wanderer mode, which you don't get experience from combat, and almost everything's friendly to you, but you do get experience for finishing quests. Sure. And so it's a great way to see more of the content of the game. But the most important thing is they have a bunch of pre-built characters that are just tough. And I think the, the, the thing that I would say in terms of getting into it is if you start a new game, play one of the tougher characters, learn how to use the sprint, and understand the importance of running away. If your character gets to 50% life and you're not sure if you're going to like be okay, you leave. 
That's an important part of being a low-level character in Caves of Cud, running away. And then just practice doing the Red Rock. The very first mission, you have to go up a couple screens, and there's a little dungeon uh, called Red Rock. Just work on that. And what, what you'll find, at least what happened with me, is going through those dungeons, I found, is so interesting. There's all these different things that can happen. Mm -hmm. And then once you get comfortable, the whole game starts opening up with that. And then you get to all the, the, weird, the weird stuff. Well, you're all spoiled because I didn't win my first game of Stellaris until 500 hours or so. So, <laughs> <laughs> uh, somebody has asked um, to get John Gilmore's space game out of Development Hell. Um, John Gilmore's space game. Yeah, yeah. apparently, space ad procedural space adventure game. It was up there a little bit. Gork IQ. Uh, it's funny. He's never mentioned it to me because we game weekly. <laughs> That's hilarious. <laughs> uh, that is. Um, when will Leader Games release a board game based on Dungeon Fortress? And Dwarf, Dwarf Fortress. Fortress. After we finish Dungeon Fortress. After we finish Dungeon Fortress. Um, that'll be the, the sequel will be Dwarf Fortress. My favorite Vital Lacerda game. I'm not crazy about Lacerda's work. I think it's good, but it's not for me. Um, I think the Gallerist Kanban. I, I don't know. I don't know. It, it's to me like we, we've been pure, talking about this lately in the studio. Something happened to Euros in like 2014 or 2013, and they got very, very, very ornate, and I kind of dropped off. And I like, I love traditional Euros. I even like like the Uwe Rosenberg, especially the early, earlier stuff, or not the earlier stuff, the mid period, like La Havre and Agricola, or Labora, um, even like even Glass Road a little bit. I like those games, but the newer school of Euro design, I think, is just it's just not for me. Um, I think Little Sir is kind of like the embodiment of that of that school of design. So I, I played CO2, so that's the only one I've played. Mm. And that's and for similar reasons when the gallers came out, I was like, that looks gorgeous. Yep. And I don't know if I have time to learn that. Yeah. I think it's it's And that's kinda of in the middle of Euro since then. Well and I I mean I just if I'm gonna play something that like ornate or Baroque maybe, I'm gonna play like a coin game or like a like a history game mm. or, or a war game or something. Because that's I don't mind complicated games. I just like I'll play a spot or something. Sure. Um, okay, let me go here. So, uh, favorite Splunky 2 progression? Uh, that's a hard question. I'm going to table it and we'll come back to it. Um, I'm pretty bad at Splunky 2 is actually the real answer. I always even though I love what I'm saying. In whole, so, yeah. <laughs> even though I love it. Uh, are you planning to do Victory Conditions in Art? Any ideas about policing a leader? Ooh, I want to talk about this one. This is a good question. Yeah. So, ARCs is... Um, I'm trying to hit those questions about policing and victory conditions from a super different perspective. The way it works is when you play the game, so the way I've been explaining it is um, it's a single campaign is like two to four sessions. Every campaign you're earning this currency called power, which you can spend in between games on upgrades and things. But during and any power you don't spend is lost. During the final session, the fourth session, uh, and every session takes an hour or a little less, uh, during the final session, your final score is how much power you generate in that game. So the player who generates the most power in the last game wins the game. But every player has a fate card. And a fate card will tell you, like it's, it's like a little mission. And it says, hey, this is what you're trying to do. Here's how you do it. If you do it, you're going to generate a little extra power. And then at the bottom of the card, there's a little chain. And it will tell you, hey, if you keep going on this line of progression, you're going to get to an alternate victory condition in two sessions or in one session. And then eventually when you get to that alternate victory condition, it'll just be on your card to say, hey, I win the game if I can destroy the Galactic Library. And that is my victory condition, that's what I'm playing for. Now, how this interacts with everything else is um, whenever every fate card after the first generation, after the first session, has a foil, has an anti-condition. And so at the start of the game, you look at what fate cards people have, and then you shuffle up a little deck equal to the number of players of the the foil cards, the villain cards, and everybody gets one of those too. So that I might be trying to do my condition and then also my secondary condition is, has to do with opposing Patrick. And so what it does is it kind of like disperses the policing re requirement. Mm. And then when you actually get to the final, final act of the game, the victory conditions are designed in such a way that 
any player can interdict you and can stop you from doing sure. it. Sure. So you do get into some of the, the oath thing, but it stops the earlier sessions from getting into that oath grind. Mm -hmm. And so the biggest difference of between arcs and other games I've worked on is like oath is so often a game about why and like what am I doing and why am I doing it? Mm -hmm. And arcs is much more about the how. Like I know what I need to do. How am I going to and so it's much more about like the execution of plans and mm -hmm. making strategic compromises. But but the game kind of says like no, th this is the act that you're doing. And then, and we'll probably talk about this more in our future chats. But then what happens is, if you fail your little mini quest that you have, it unlocks different content into the game depending on what happens on those quests. And then on future turns, you can say, you know what, I hate my quest. I want to do something different. And there are like stage two fate cards that you can consider like pivoting to at various points that sounds really cool thanks we should make that game yeah <laughs> it's, it's this is what, what do you make people should we make that <laughs> this is what i mean by arcs being like having a lot it's gonna be hard to do all the content like i'm, I'm just trying to make the rules that are going to help us like write the content for uh for all the the stuff that we want to do with the design uh but it's getting it's getting close i'm just um, having you have the most territory you get a, you get two points you just can't <laughs> well, but but I think appropriate for I mean I really think about like like arcs for me is I'm thinking about you know if if root and oath are oriented around questions about the genre and strategy games arcs like takes a step back and says like okay is there a different way of approaching that that question and so it does feel like a simpler version of root that is attempting to do both like, answer questions about asymmetric gameplay and also answer questions about campaign style gameplay dungeon fortress is takes two steps back from what we're doing mm -hmm. and is really like about like the elements of the form mm -hmm. um i don't think it, it, it that makes it sound like it's more abstract than it is but i do think it like we're simpler <laughs> yeah i mean there's so there's this game going around right now i don't know if you've followed it called dungeon encounters uh, yeah, and that, that's it's, from Square. Uh, it's from Square Enix, yeah. and it's like some of the original Final Fantasy crew uh -huh. made a totally stripped-down dungeon game uh -huh. that is like, what if we just think about like what it really means to like grind through a dungeon? Right. And so like this is a game for like the people that loved wizardry. Uh -huh. And if you think about Final Fantasy as being a reaction to wizardry yeah. and those other computer RPGs from yeah. like the late '80s and early '90s. Or, I don't know, I'm messing my timeline. 80s, yeah. The 80s, yeah, the yeah, 80s, yeah, yeah. right? If you think about, how, a lot of JRPGs were a reaction to those early computer mm -hmm. RPGs, right? And so, the Dungeon Encounters is like, what if we went back to that branch in the tree, and instead of building Final Fantasy, we built something that was like even more stripped down and more directly sure. in line with sure. wizardry? Uh, and so I think about Dungeon Fortress as being like, taking this further step back in the evolutionary train and saying like, let's go explore that, that yeah. other corner. I'm still sad Wizardry 3 is not... The branch of, a school, of like a school of design. Yeah, I mean, there's... Because yeah. Wizardry 3 had that, like, awesome conceit that you're trying to escape the dungeon mm -hmm. as the, like, the former... Like, you're yeah. the villain from the second one. And your only friends are creatures you summon and then force into battle for you. Yeah, I... It, it is... It's so funny when you go back and look... I mean, it's the reason why the shelf that Pat and I are looking at when we do these streams is filled with all these old 80s games, none of which I think are perfect, mm -hmm. but all of which are like, oh, that was... That would have been a cool thing if that would have... That would have taken off. Yeah, yeah. Right? What if Time Agent would have been the next big thing? <laughs> um, so I'm bring, you're hearing it for first, so I'm bringing Wizardry 3 back. Uh, so uh, quick answers. Clockwork 2 is done. It's at the press. It's it's cooking right along. Yep. Um, future Ford expansions, we have a couple that are under consideration, but we're uh, right now, like, the person who would be in charge of them is Nick, and he he's, is, busy, he's busy on the yeah. whole, so it's waiting. And Grant just had a baby. And Grant just had a baby. baby. I, so yeah, he's Grant's pitched me a couple designs for that, and then he's he's also pitched me a different game in the universe. So see, see what yeah. happens. And and also like if you've been playing Cats and Dogs, you know that like it really fills out the design. And so I think w with our expansions, sometimes when companies um, launch new products, especially in like Kickstarter land, they go wild with expansions because what they want to do is create like an entire product line in one punch mm -hmm. and even the, if we want the same things i think the ethos of this studio is like well let's see if it does okay and we'll be thinking about wanting hopefully to turn it like i would love arcs to turn into a whole thing that we can support for years and years 
But we'll launch it with a box and a small expansion, and then we'll see how it goes. And then if it gets supported, it gets supported. But uh, we, we, we try to be a little bit more measured about future content. Um, how many more root expansions? Who knows? Thousands. Oh, um, ARCs is a three or four player game. Someone asked what ARCs player count. Three or four players. There's a possibility it might work with two, but if it doesn't, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna bend myself backwards uh -huh. to make it work with two. One of the important thing about arcs is that you need the same group for the full campaign. Now campaigns are only two to four sessions, uh -huh. and so one way I'm thinking about arcs is a lot of campaign games in, bo in board game land right now are like 15 hours to 40 hours. Uh -huh. They're huge commitments. And arcs is like this is a this is small pandemic legacy. This is you want a arc, you want a campaign game, but you don't want to spend fifteen or twenty or thirty hours doing it. Mm -hmm. Arcs will get you there in three to five. Yeah, um, and that's coming from my own experience as a game player. I was talking about this with Nick. How like I used to get really excited about a game that took eighty hours to play, and now I'm like, give me five. <laughs> like Inscription seems very exciting to me because I think it's not very long. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Like Hand of Fate. That yeah. That sounds fabulous. Um, how is ARC's design for packing and setting up later? We're still working on that, but it's going to be simpler than Oath. Potentially even like there are 18 spots on the map and there's a tray with 18 little boxes and you just put your pieces in the box and that's and then, and then you go on to the next thing. Mm -hmm. uh, one thing that's different from ARC's than Oath is that your player position is ported seamlessly. So everything that you have at the end of one game, you get next game. Um, do, 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 uh, which answers that? Patrick. Yeah, uh, yeah until, you the, until the Battle Royale is, yeah, is, correct. is a thing. Yeah, no, that's that's right. Uh, okay, any new games that you're looking at, Patrick? Uh, boy, I was trying to find my like recently Kickstarted stuff because I've been I I got I went hot on Kickstarter again. Uh, so that's just watch me there. I guess there's been a lot of like little asymmetric designs popping up on mm -hmm. Kickstarter. I did back something big. Uh, fractals. Back fractals. Oh, cool. Yeah, yeah. I did too. I'm also very curious. About yeah, I'm very curious to see how that turns out. Um, and then, you know, Travis Hill. Uh, all game design is now described as Hillian. Yep. From here forward, it is now posted. I just got my shipping notice for Western Rails, which is the one he did with Holland Spiel. Sure. So I'll get that hopefully soon. I'm excited yeah. about it. So to, to, you understand that, right? All game design previous to 2021 was pre. Hillian. Pre Hillian, and now we are in. And now we're era. now in the Hill era, and then we'll soon be post Hill. He it, it, like I think both with Travis, especially if you include all his mag magazine work and Amabel, I just don't understand how they produce that many games each year. Because, mm -hmm. And I think what I'm finding is I am both a little slow at it, mm -hmm. and also the kinds of games that I want to work on are especially hard. Right. Like, or not not hard, just they, they take a long time. Um. And so I wonder if I should maybe not. <laughs> I thought Arch was going to be so simple. And then when I started mapping out how much content there was going to be, I was like, oh, I, I done made no thing again. And this is going to take a long time. Well, you know, our, you know our like far out schedule. And you know what I'm going to ask you to do at some point. So yeah. we'll, see, we'll see where we're at. No train game. Don't take this as a train, train game. game. <laughs> um, uh, I, I, I'm not going to talk about Phil Ackman. I will, well, <laughs> yeah, you can. Here's what I'll say. Um, some people will ask me if I'm ever going to make. Yeah, sorry. People ask me if I'm ever going to make another PAX game because I do love PAX games, and my answer is like I made a PAX game. I really like it, and I think it's aged really well, and I'm happy that people are finding it and enjoying it still. And I don't really want to make another PAX game because I made one, and uh, like and when it comes to the ultimate PAX game, I mean I, you know. I think that Oath is a little paxy and it's and how it's developed. I, you know, there's there's like a really long conversation about Oath's genealogy and how it relates to the Pax games and also the Lords games. But I think I'm like kind of done with that space. There are other types of games that I want to make, and so I'm not really super into making another Pax game. I think there's more stuff people can do. I've played a game called Pax Illuminati or Illuminate, which is about not like it's not Steve Jackson's Illuminati. It's like actually about like. Bavaria and the historical mm -hmm. Illuminati, but it was really cool. And I'm like, oh, this is a totally different way of exploring this decision space. And I think Transhumanity, which is a PAX game I like a lot, it's designed by Matt. 
uh, Eklund, and I think that's going to get a second edition at some point. Mm, yeah, I'm trying to get you to teach it to me. I know, it's sitting... Oh, it's, it's in, in my office. office. Yeah. What about Pax Pax? We're going to make a game about making Pax games. That sounds great. I'm just imagining <laughs> the, the pax Um Yeah, I just, you know, I think one of the things that is so exciting about working in design is making the decision to not work in a genre. Like, people ask me, like, oh, you should make a train game. I'm like, no, there yeah. are good train games. Yeah, it's, it's pretty good, yeah. I, like, love, like, the place, 18xx design right now is in such a fertile, interesting place. I have, like, nothing to add. I just want to play it. Um, okay, cool. Well, I think we've gone over our limit. We've gone way over. Way over. Sorry. So we're running out of internet minutes. Uh, Patrick, do you have anything else to add? Uh, yeah, I, I, I would like to jump on here and plug uh, Atlas Games, our shipping partner, is running a Kickstarter right now for Plain Gia. Plain Gia. Mm -hmm. uh, and it is a 5e setting set in like a fantasy world where it's dinosaurs and humans, which didn't actually it happen on the earth sure. that's that's fine uh you can have um you know your warlock can have a pact with the triceratops god and and so on it is made by uh david somerville who is a uh, designer emeritus here he, he worked on the first bass game with me mm -hmm. um and it has some of his charm and design skill in it and frankly we got a pre we got a preview of the book uh, kyle and i did and i like for my money, it's as good as some of the stuff Bossy's putting out. So I so I will say I have like zero interest in a five E setting, mm -hmm. but I read every word of that campaign page because I just got so into what it was doing as a setting. Yeah, yeah. Like it's just like the, the way that it like handles like stuff that's in D and D like things like the religious elements like like the gods and stuff. Mm -hmm. Kind of like it can get footnoted in weird ways, and I thought that setting did such a good job of like bringing all the different thematic notes together. Yeah, I think it's really expertly done. I just want to be a Triceratops warlock. So I, he's thinking about religion. Like, it seems like I'm thinking about the pew pew pew. Like, yeah. uh, and I you know and I, I think like uh, for whatever it's worth, like I, David's a fantastic designer, and I think he's gonna. I think we're gonna see a lot more from him. And uh, anything, any last notes for you? I think that's it. Uh, it is lovely to spend a little afternoon with y'all, and I hope everyone has a lovely day. Uh, remember two things. One, if you're going to pack some plugs, come by the booth. You can see uh, some of the new stuff we're working on, and if you uh, have any parts of your collection you want to fill out, I think we're going to have pretty much all the games there. You can meet uh, lots of folks from the operation team, and you give them their th give them your thanks for the fact that they were able to get stuff to you this last calendar year. And finally, remember that uh, the Winter Tournament begins this Friday. We will be retweeting, of course, the opening game. And we'll hopefully be talking about it as it goes along. All right, that's everything. And we will talk to you all at the start of December. So have a lovely day and enjoy the rest of fall. Mm.